So what we're talking about together is journey into God's Word. And you guys be patient with me. I'm trying for the first time to run my own slides. Uh, we'll see how it goes. In the future, maybe we'll have a remote. It'll be a little easier, but we're just going to, we're winging it, okay? Winging it together. So well, this is what we're talking about, journey into God's Word. This picture represents the journey from their town on the left side, the time the Bible was written, who it was written to, all the way over to our town, which is where we are now. Because one thing we forget a lot of times is that before the Bible was written to us, it was written to someone else, specifically in a time. And so what we're doing here is we're trying to grasp what the text meant to them in their town. And then step number two, anybody remember that? Measuring the width of the river. This is where we stop and say, okay, what's different about our culture, our time, our language, our covenant, our situation, than this situation? And then step number three, we... The principalizing bridge. Ian, you're the man. Okay, And so that's where we look at things that are similar from what was happening at that time or their situation or their, their language, their culture to what's similar to ours, and as we make those similarities, we see this principle that whatever God was saying to them, this is the way He's saying that to us. And after we find that principle, we go look through the rest of Scripture, see if that principle's there. Once we find that principle and we see that Scripture is consistent about that principle, then we go to step number four, grasping the text in our town where we apply the text to ourselves. Um, last week, this week, and I don't know, maybe next week... <laughs> We're on step number one, grasping the text in their town. This is where we're asking the question, what did this passage, this verse, this text of the Bible mean to the original audience? Okay, what did, what did it mean? For example, if we go to a verse in Genesis that says, I want you to go sacrifice your son, your only son, on an altar to me. And we're like, well, I guess God wants me to go sacrifice my son on an altar. And so we go sacrifice our son. Is that really what the Bible is trying to tell us at that point? No, because it was, specifically, it, it was specifically for Abraham. It was tied to that situation. So before we cross this principle and apply it to ourselves, we have to ask this question. What did the text mean to the original biblical audience? And this is just a, a review of what we've done last week. The first step, and we're still talking about it today, is observe. This is when we come to the Bible, and you see these sheets of paper. Uh, I know we have a lot of people here. It's your first time, and you're like, what in the world is going on? Why are they holding paper? What is she talking about? What, what, what? Uh, good news is, the lessons are online. You can watch video. The slides will be on the video. You can hear the audio, and that's a way for you to catch up if you want to. Uh, just a quick overview. Last week, we talked about observing. This is where we look, look, and look again. And we come not asking, well, what is this... What does this verse mean? We ask, what does this verse say? Because before we can know what it means, we have to know what it says. You remember I used the analogy of, it's raining cats and dogs. Now what do I mean? It's raining really hard, but what did I say? It's raining cats and dogs. So if you don't speak English, or that's the first time you've ever heard that expression, and I say it's raining cats and dogs, you're going to think I'm crazy. So first you have to stop and look at what I said, try to figure out what I'm talking about, then we can go on to what, it, what does it mean. And then the third thing is don't overthink it. So you don't have to come and say, okay, what would Pastor Jordan find here? Don't do that. You don't have to come and say, okay, uh, for those of you who've been to camp, what would Greg Boone find in this passage? Don't overthink it. Also, don't underthink it. So you don't want to come to a verse and say, like we talked about last week, Jesus wept. Well, I guess he was just upset about something and cried. I got it. I understand it and move on. So don't overthink and don't underthink. Last week specifically, we looked at trying to find these things in passages. And you just heard Anna give an example of some of them. Uh, almost all of them, I think. Repetition of words, contrasts, comparisons, lists, cause and effect, figures of speech, conjunctions, verbs, and pronouns. And some of you are thinking, what does all that matter? The reason it matters is because right here we're asking the question, what does it say? Not what does it mean, what does it say? And before we can get to what does it mean, we want to figure out what it says. And now I want to take what we learned last week and kind of challenge you with it now. And we're going to play a game, okay? All right. Everybody ready? Anybody nervous? Wait. I don't even know what happened. Okay. Here's the good thing. Here's the good thing. 
You can play this game if you've never been here in your whole life. So feel good, right? You have a question, Thurston? None. This game, this game, you don't even have to read. Just pictures, okay? What is that? If you think, raise your hand. A fly eye. Anybody think something else? One of those things you stick your... A uh, Venus flytrap? It's an optical illusion. Anybody have anything else? Listen, 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 listen. What? It's all the what? It's all the senator seats on Star Wars. That's pretty good right there. A strawberry. A zoomed in kickball. A lot of red bumps. A zitty face. <laughs> Any other grown ups have, have input? Miss Jennifer? A tongue? Anybody else? Sydney? Sydney says stoplight. Okay. What do you think? It's a red light. That's what Sydney said. Okay. So here, listen. Everybody's listening. Everybody's listening. We have a fly eye. We have a dodgeball. We have a stoplight. We have the senator seats on Star Wars. We have a tongue. We have uh, what else? A strawberry. He said strawberry. Okay. So this is the thing. Ready? It's a fly eye. It is a fly eye. A bug. A bug. Piper knows. That's a bug. Okay. Now here's the thing. When you looked at it up close, did you see all those details? You see ridges and lights and shadows and spheres and shapes. You could observe a ton of things. But you couldn't really tell what it was. We were just taking guesses. But when you step back from it a little bit, oh, clearly that's a fly's eye. Okay? Next one. What is that? <laughs> Please raise your hand. Please raise your hand. I can't believe it's not butter. Miss Jennifer? A Pringles can. Thurston, a can of cheese. Sour cream and onion. Cheddar and sour cream chips. Cheddar and sour cream chips. It is Pringles. And the onions. And the onions. And the cheese. Okay, here we go. You ready? You ready? Oh, it is Pringles. Okay. All right. Who's feeling good? Who's feeling good right now? You're, you're pretty good at this. Are you guys two for two? Did you guys get it? Okay, here we go. You ready? If you have an answer, raise your hand so we can collect all the answers, okay? All right. Patrick. A smoke detector. What? The bottom of a shoe? Yes. The bottom of a golf club event? It's an airplane. An airplane? He don't know. Don't. A speaker? Miss Teresa? Listen, listen, listen. A drain? A water drain? A cloud? Anybody else? Okay, here we go. Here we go. Listen. Listen. Anticipation is coming. Ready? I can tell you this. Everyone's wrong. You ready? Yes. Oh, whoa. Nobody even knows. What is that? <laughs> Whose cell phone looks like that? Okay. Okay, here we go. Here's the next one. If you can hear me, clap once. Clap twice if you can hear me. Clap three times. All right, here we go. Raise your hand. A water hose. A drill. A gas nozzle. Gas nozzle. Anybody? A pogo stick. A what? A bike. Okay. A scooter? Anybody else? An air compressor? That's pretty good, Bird. 
I didn't even know you could say compressor. Anybody else? Metal. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Some people are going to be really happy. Oh, it is a gas nozzle. It is a gas nozzle. Good job. Okay, here we go. Raise your hand. Thurston. A toilet. Malia. A window on an airplane. The Oreo logo. Wait, wait, wait. Listen, listen, listen. What? The things that you put in the toilet, it makes them blue. Listen, listen, listen. Got something? An Oreo Thins container. Peppermint Lifesaver. Anybody have anything else? Okay, here we go. Here we go. You ready? You ready? Oh. Okay, if you can hear me clap once, if you can hear me clap twice, if you can hear me clap three times. Okay, so we spent the majority of our time together last week getting as close as we could, seeing as much detail as we could, trying to understand what does this verse or this passage say. And essentially, we're looking for the little things. And now this week, I want to turn our observation skills a little bit, looking for those details, but not as close, just a little bit further. Because sometimes we can get too close. And we can try to see too many details. And when we do that, we can take a detail and isolate it from the big picture. And when the details are isolated from the big picture, we still don't know what the picture is. And we can take guests, sometimes we can be right because we've seen these things other places. We know absolutely there's no doubt in my mind that that's an Oreo logo. I know that. And someone is going to say, there's no doubt in my mind, that's a peppermint lifesaver. There's no doubt in my mind, it's one of those things you put in the toilet that turns the water blue. Okay? But here's the thing. Until we step back and see the whole picture, we don't really know who's right. We're just taking guesses, okay? So what I want us to do is learn the next stage of observation, the next stage of understanding and applying God's Word, the next step of journeying into God's Word, grasping the text in the town, understanding what did this mean to the original biblical audience. We're going to talk about keeping our eye on the horizon. And what that means is we're looking out to see the little details, but also we're stepping back to say... What do these little details come together? What kind of picture do they come together to make? So tonight we're going to look at general to specific. We're going to look at questions and answers. We're going to look at dialogue. We're going to look at purpose and result statements. We're going to look at means. We're going to look at conditional clauses. We're going to look at actions and roles. We're going to look at emotional terms. And we're going to look at the tone of a passage. Okay? So... This week, we're gonna, I'm going to help you guys out a little bit. I'm not going to put the pauses in between and give you time to look at it. That's going to come on the homework when you're doing it on your own, okay? So general to specific. Sometimes in the Bible, there'll be an idea introduced, very, very general, and then a couple verses later, we find out the specifics of that idea. And when we step back from a verse or a passage, that can really help us to see something like this. For example, I could say... I like dessert. Okay, and now you are going to have to make me a dessert for supper tomorrow. And all I say to you is, I like dessert. Now that could mean a ton of things. That could mean I like all kinds of dessert. That could mean I only like one kind of dessert, so you better make that kind. And if you don't know, then we have a problem. It's just a very general statement. Or I could say to you, I like dessert. I really love apple pie with vanilla ice cream. So now, if, you have, if you're going to make me a dessert, what are you probably going to make me? Because I took you from a general statement, I like dessert, to a specific statement. I really love apple pie and vanilla ice cream. This happens in the Bible. Galatians 5.16, the Apostle Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So, walking by the Spirit, very general thing to say. The desires of the flesh, 
very general thing to say, if that's all that was in there, we'd have a really hard time saying, is this walking by the Spirit or is this just a desire of the flesh? Because that's very general. But the good thing for us is, he goes on. So three verses later, he says, now the works of the flesh are evident. And we looked at these last week and he gives this big list of all the works of the flesh. And then he says, the fruit of the Spirit is, and gives this big list of the fruit of the Spirit. So he's taken us from, this is general, walking by the flesh, or walking by the Spirit, the desires of the flesh, desires of the Spirit. Now here's specific. These are some things, if you're walking in sexual immorality, impurity, immorality, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, if you're walking in these things, those are the works of the flesh. Those are the desires of the flesh. If you want to walk by the Spirit, look for this in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So if you notice that, if you just stop at verse 16, I say walk by the Spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. If that's where you stop at trying to understand and apply the Bible, you're going to miss it. Right? So we want to come in and see, okay, here's a detail. There's two things being contrasted here. The works of the flesh and the works of the Spirit. Great. Now what? Take a step back and see the big picture, okay? Any questions about that one? All right. Questions and answers. This is a form of writing that's used very often in Psalms, in Proverbs, in the teachings of Jesus. Jesus asks people questions all the time, waits for them to answer. They don't answer, so then he gives the answer. The Apostle Paul asks rhetorical questions and then answers them, okay? So it's very important because if we just go to a verse looking for details and we find this question and we don't keep reading to find the answer, then we're probably not going to walk away understanding and applying the Bible correctly. And if we go further, further back to where we're starting from, we're definitely not going to understand what they're saying to the original audience, right? So here's an example. Romans chapter 5, he says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass. So the law of God came in to show us how bad sin was. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that, there's a purpose statement, as sin reigned in death, Grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's great. So wherever sin goes, God's grace goes further. So that as the wages of sin is death, sin leads to death, grace comes and leads to eternal life. That's great. And then he says, what shall we say then? There's a question. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Another question. If grace is this good then why don't we sin more so we can get more grace? If sin brings grace, well, let's sin so we can get more grace if it's that good. Then he answers this. That's Romans 6, 1. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Romans 6, 2. By no means is your answer. Absolutely not. God forbid. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So you see how if you just look at one of those verses and you don't read the verse with the answer in it, you're going to walk away with a question. You're going to be confused. But if you take a step back, like, oh, what is this? Well, maybe it's a dodgeball. Maybe it's a stoplight. I don't know what it is. But if you take a step back, oh, it's a fly's eye. Duh. Right? So that's the same thing we want to do with questions and answers when we come, let's find them in the Bible. Um, dialogue. And though we're not in English class, Thurston, we're doing Bible class. Dialogue is something that's very easy for us to notice when we come to the Scripture. Somebody give me a definition of what a dialogue is. Like a long speech between people, two people talking back and forth. Like, in some ways, in, in some sense, you could say like, okay, it's just two people going having a conversation. Specifically, two people who are having a conversation with an intended goal. It has a specific theme. They're talking for a purpose. Dialogue is very easy to recognize in Scripture. If you come here on Sunday mornings, we're going through a dialogue right now. John chapter 4, the woman at the well. Jesus and this woman are in a dialogue. Jesus says something, she says something. Jesus asks a question, she answers. She asks a question, Jesus answers. They're in a dialogue. Now, here's the problem. Our first tendency when we want to understand a dialogue is we want to take one sentence or one question out of that dialogue and put it over here by itself. We want to chop it up, trying to figure out what, what does it mean. Oh, well, Jesus said this, so this must be what it means. And that can be very dangerous. So to keep from putting an entire dialogue on the screen and going through 20 slides, I just put these questions up here for you uh, to remember 
If you have time, write them down. If not, you can go back and watch the video, write them down. When you come to a dialogue in Scripture, ask questions like this. Number one, who are the participants? Who's talking here? And whenever I see that in a dialogue, I give each of them a color. Okay, Jesus, the woman. Jesus, the woman. Even when I find the pronouns, it's talking about them. He, she, Jesus, Christ, woman, Samaritan. I, I give them that color, and I follow it all the way through. Highlight them in that color. If they say something, I'll underline it in that color. Try to keep up with them. Then you ask, who is speaking to whom? We're going to see this dialogue between Jesus and this woman next Sunday, or the Sunday after that, after homecoming. It actually shifts to Jesus and his disciples. Same story, same situation, same place. The dialogue is shifted. So who's speaking to whom? Then, what is the setting? Where are they at? Why are they talking about this? What's going on around them? Next question. Are other people around? Is Jesus having this dialogue with the rich young man while everyone else is around? So if he is, that probably gives you a good um, insight that Jesus is saying something to this young man, but by connection, he's also saying it to everybody else who can hear. Okay? So are other people around? Are others listening Are they joining in? Sometimes Jesus would talk to somebody. Jesus is giving a a sermon one time, and he's he's preaching, and everybody's excited, everybody's listening, and someone calls out from the crowd. And his sermon goes from being a sermon to a dialogue. This woman just randomly calls out of the crowd, Blessed is your mother. Jesus doesn't ignore it. He says, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and do it. So, are others listening? Are others joining in? This is an important question to ask. Is the dialogue an argument? And that doesn't mean, okay, Jesus just rolled up his sleeves, unbuttoned his top button, and he's getting ready to fight with somebody. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean Jesus is pointing his finger at somebody or screaming or somebody's screaming at somebody else. What argument can mean here is that this side is believing this and talking about this, and this one's talking about this. So they're trying to talk about two different points this morning in our service. Do we worship on this mountain or do we worship on this mountain? Trying to start an argument. Let's take this point and set it beside this point and see which one is right. Is the dialogue a discussion? Is it just Jesus and Nicodemus sitting around? Nicodemus comes at night and they're just sitting there having a conversation, just discussing things. Is it a lecture? Is Jesus up on the Mount of Olives and calling all people unto him and saying, Blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the earth. Is it a lecture? Is it friendly chit-chat? Is Jesus just talking to his disciples while they're walking down the road? Who do people say that I am? Just friendly conversation. And then, ask this question, what is the point? Why is this conversation happening? And to do that, we have to get out of one verse and step back and look at it, okay? Any questions about dialogue? All right. Purpose and result statements. This is directly related to, I would say, almost the same thing, just used in a different sense as cause and effect statements. Um, We want to notice them, however, from a distance. So here's an example. John chapter 3. Um, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. So here's some purposes. The Son of Man is going to be lifted up. It's a purpose. God so loved the world He has a purpose in doing that. God didn't send His Son into the world to condemn the world. He has a purpose. What's the result? Son of man's lifted up so that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. God so loved the world. What's the result in that? He gave His only Son. That's not just a result. It's also a purpose. What's the purpose? That whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God didn't send His Son to condemn the world. That's a purpose. What purpose did He send Him for? And what was the result? In order that the world might be saved through Him. Do you see that? Now, if we take those couple verses and we say, okay, these purposes, what's this passage about? We're probably moving towards the direction of saying this passage is about believing in Jesus so that you can have eternal life. Okay? Any questions? Okay. The next one, means. By the word means, I mean, uh, by which something is accomplished. So what brings something about? For example, how can a young man keep his way pure? This is what's intended to be brought about. A young person keeping their way pure. We're talking about purity. How does that happen? What are the means? By guarding it according to your word. So you see that? Our homework was Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Jesus comes and he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples. 
So that's the means. What's the means? All authority is His. And since all authority is His, He can tell us to do whatever He wants. Since all authority is His, nothing can stop His purpose. Therefore, go make disciples. So the means, when we come to a passage like this, uh, and this is just one verse, so when we step back even bigger and look at the whole of Psalm 119, it's just full of means, uh, telling us what we want to bring about and how to bring it about. And that's really important when you're studying the Bible. Any questions about that? Would also be question and answers. They can, they can be like... Absolutely. Can be cause and effect. If you take it from means to cause and effect, you say, um, what's the cause? Guarding your ways according to the word. And what's the effect? Your, your way will be pure. So a lot of these overlap. And as you look at them from the different angles, you see deeper meaning and greater meaning. And you have more understanding, right? Here's another one. Conditional clauses. This is really where we're looking for if and then. You see this a lot of times in the Old Testament. God will tell His people, if you do this, it's a famous passage, right? Everybody talks about that revival or, or uh, when people want to have prayer meetings. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. So that's a conditional clause. This example I put up here, I know it's hard to see. I had to make it smaller. There's a lot of text, so I apologize about that. But let's look at some of these conditions. In the first red one, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness. So there's a condition. We're walking in darkness and saying we have fellowship with Him. That's the Father. There's no then there. It's implied. If we say that, we lie and do not practice the truth. So if we say we fellowship with the Father while we walk in darkness... We're lying, not practicing the truth. Here's the next one. But, there's a contrast, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. There's another. Third one in there, if we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Another one. If we confess our sins, this one's really hard to see, I'm sorry about that, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's another one. If we say we have not sinned, then we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Everybody see those? And that really brings out the, 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 the meaning of this passage, especially trying to understand what it meant to this original audience. He's telling them, if you're saying this, then this is really the case. But if you're doing this, then this is the case. But if you're doing this, then this is the case. And if you're doing this, then this is the case. So it really opens up that whole passage. Next thing, actions and roles. This is where we take the step we learned last week, looking at verbs, looking for the action, what's happening, who's doing what, and we see who is doing it here. Uh, for example, this passage right here, Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So here's what we're talking about. The law of the Spirit of life, it has an action. It has a role. It's done something. It has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Then, for God, so this is who has the role, has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending His own Son. So God has done something conquered the weakness of the law by sending His Son. And then He goes on to say that He condemned sin in the flesh. That was the one who came in the flesh. That's the Son. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Here's someone else who has a role. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we hear that just in our lesson tonight. Walking according to the flesh and walking according to the Spirit. If we stop there, it's very vague. So where can we go? We just looked at Galatians 5. It gives us a very specific list of what it means to walk in the Spirit or to walk in the flesh. So when you notice those action and roles, it helps us know, follow this passage and see who's doing what and what kind of role do they have, what action are they carrying out. And that helps us follow it through, try to understand the meaning. Okay. Next thing, emotional terms. This is a passage from Jeremiah chapter 3. It says, God talking to the people of Israel. I said how I would set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land, a heritage most beautiful of all nations. And I thought you would call me my father and would not turn from following me. Surely as a treacherous wife leaves her husband, so you have been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. So 
When we see a passage like this, it tells us the Bible is not just this big book of abstract ideas, emotionless, dry, boring. God's using some emotional terms to say something here. What could be more intimate relationship? And this is the relationship, even if we've had bad ones, the reason that we think they're bad is because we know in our mind what they should be between a father and son. You say, well, you don't know the father I had. Well, the reason you think you had a bad father is because you know what a relationship between a father and son should be like. So when the Lord says to Israel, I was going to set you among my sons. I thought you would call me my father. And you didn't. That's emotional. There's a lot of emotion behind that. He says, what could, be, what could be a more intimate relationship than a husband and wife who agree to be together for the rest of their life? And he says, just like a treacherous wife leaves her husband, so you've been treacherous to me. Imagine the heartbreak that those of you who uh, aren't married yet. Imagine the heartbreak of getting married. You decide out of all the people in the whole world, this is the person you want to spend the rest of your life with. And you decide to get married. And then one day, for no reason at all, they just decide to leave you for someone else. You think that's going to be an emotional time in your life? Probably is. We struggle with just having a boyfriend or a girlfriend break up with us and go on to somebody else. Right? So take that more somebody you've committed the rest of your life to. This is the emotion that's coming out of this passage. Like a son who's leaving his father, turning his back on his father. Like a wife who's left her husband and doesn't want to come back. That's the emotion that's in this passage. So it really helps us to get a deeper understanding of this passage. And as we see these emotional uh, terms, it really leads us to see the tone of a passage. And what I mean by that is as you notice the emotion, you feel the tone of a passage. You can almost hear how the person who wrote it is saying it. Here's one. See if you can find the tone in this. You'll be upset whenever I tell you what it is. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Where do, what tone do you think that passage has? Or maybe a question before that. Do you see any emotional terms in that passage? Nobody? Everybody's looking hard? You have died. You have died? Might be a little emotional. Here's the reason you can't find one. That passage is just a straightforward, I'm just communicating truth to you. That's the tone of it. I'm not angry with you. I'm not upset with you. I'm not overly happy. I'm not in love. I'm not depressed. I just have a truth that I want to tell you. So there's no tone in that passage. Now listen to this one. Now I'll kind of give you some clues. Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. How many of you have ever had somebody mad at you, been fighting with somebody, and they say, well, just let me ask you this. <laughs> that ever happened? Yeah? Your parents ever said that to you? Okay. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer? That word literally means experience. Did you experience so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? You feel an emotional tone in that passage? You think he's happy? Think he's a little angry? He's a little upset? I mean, what if the preacher got up on Sunday morning and said, you stupid people. I mean, oh my gosh, I would leave, you know? I can't even imagine. And that's what he's saying. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Somebody casts a spell on you to make you think things that are so crazy? That's what he's saying. That's the tone of that passage. And we know that by the use of those, those deeply emotional words, okay? Here's another one. This is Jesus. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Notice that exclamation point. I didn't put that there. It's there. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter it yourselves nor allow those who would enter it to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, that's a convert, a disciple, and when he becomes a disciple, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. Gosh! You think he's happy? You think he's like, hey, 
I'm just here to save the world. You think that's the, that you think that's the tone of this passage? He's a little serious, okay? And now, this, this is the reason it's important. Because you will have people, we talked about this on Wednesday night, you will have people who say, well, you know, Jesus was just about forgiveness. Jesus just, you know, he just loved people. Oh yeah, he did love them. Enough to tell them that they were hypocrites and children of hell. Because sometimes our emotions, the way they come across, they may come across one way and can still be motivated by another emotion. If my little girl is about to step out in front of traffic, I'm going to snatch her up very aggressively and she's probably going to get disciplined for it. Not because I don't love her, because I do love her. But when we're talking about understanding and applying the Bible, especially understanding it to the people it was written, now none of us in here would call ourselves scribes or Pharisees. But what we can do is we can say whoever these people were, Jesus was upset with them about something. And so we see the tone of that passage. Uh, Does anybody have any questions? Okay, here's where it gets fun. And the good thing for you is your group work after this and your homework are going to be the same thing. So I don't know how much paper we have. I can make you a copy of this. We'll have one per group. If you want one to just go ahead and take home, you can't print it at home. If you'd like to go ahead and get a jump start on your homework, that's fine. I mean, I'm sure it's nothing for us to buy some paper, I don't guess, so we, we can do that. Here's, your, here's what I want you to do now. Take everything that we've just learned... Everything that we learned last week, and if you don't get to what we learned last week, that's okay because I want you to just step out and see this a little bigger. Look at this passage and notice as much as you can. Okay? And I've put this, the one that's printed out is uh, the same one as the Bibles that we've given you. So you're not going to have to be going back, well, why does this use this word and this use this word? It's the same as you got in your hand. So that's why we're trying to all get the same Bible so we're all reading and understanding the same thing, okay? So as you go to this passage, I want you to look for as much as you can see. That doesn't mean you have to see everything. That doesn't mean if Thurston sees something that Zach doesn't see, that Thurston's better or Zach's worse or Zach's better or Thurston's wrong or Corey's right. Okay? Let's just look at it. This is where we're at in this step. This is why it's important to say, what does it say before we go to where does, what does it mean? All right? And for everybody who's freaking out right now, this is going to be up on the screen for you. Okay? Any questions before we do this? We have paper here. Groups of three or four. If you have to get in a group bigger, that's okay. We can go to five or six. Don't get any bigger than six people. It's hard to stay on task. If you have a question, feel free to come and ask me.